Hi, everyone. Um, on behalf of the Russell Sage Foundation, uh, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, and Duke University, uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you back and to welcome all of the people on the live stream as well. Uh, we're going to hear now a, a research talk from Duncan Watts. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce Duncan for many reasons. Uh, one of which is very personal, which is Duncan is the person that introduced me into computational social science. So Duncan is my dissertation advisor. And in the early 2000s, I met Duncan, and he was saying, hey, this internet thing is going to be big. <laughs> uh, and it turns out he was right. Um, and so we're very fortunate that on this first day, uh, we have one of the first people to realize the potential of this research. And Duncan has been um, doing this kind of research and shaping the field for many years. And now he's also doing very important work in terms of trying to help create infrastructure so that computational social science can become an important part of science. So he, he is serving on a number of boards and advisory panels. Uh, he's also playing a major role in the um, IC2S2 conference, uh, International Conference for Computational Social Science, and a number of other activities to try to help bring uh, computational social science forward and to help us all do the kinds of things that we love to do. So thank you for all that help. And now we are all very excited to hear about your research on contagion on social networks. Welcome, Duncan. Uh, be talking about uh, a series of, of, of research projects that I've, I've worked on over the years with my colleagues uh, at Yahoo Research uh, and, and more recently Microsoft Research. Um, but I want to st uh, start off by, by just sort of talking about what I mean by contagion and social contagion uh, and, and, and motivate uh, uh, the, uh, the, the sort of general uh, concern. So when I say contagion, I imagine that uh, most of you have some sort of mental model uh, in, your, in your mind. Uh, and it probably looks something like one of these pictures here. Uh, and this mental model really comes from uh, a biological uh, 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 context, uh, where if you think about uh, some sort of epidemic of disease uh, starting out of nowhere, so, uh, for example, the Ebola epidemic that, that started in uh, West Africa uh, uh, just a few years ago uh, really looked something like this, where a, at some point in time, a single individual uh, was infected uh, by the virus, uh, probably through some contact with an animal reservoir. And then that person, uh, probably a hunter, uh, went back to uh, his, uh, uh, his home and infected just a handful of, of other people, probably members of his family or neighbors. Uh, and then uh, each of those people got sick, uh, and then they uh, became symptomatic and infected uh, a handful of other people, and then each of them infected a handful of other people. And this, uh, this uh, uh, contagion process spread out through many generations uh, to infect a very large number, tens of thousands of people over a very uh, large geographical area. And so when we say contagion, I would claim uh, that um, the mental model that we have in mind has something, uh, has the, the, these, 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 these three properties of being large, uh, of being multi-step, and being peer-to-peer. -peer, right? So that at, at any uh, given generation, you're only uh, infecting a few other people. Uh, but because of this exponential growth over many generations, uh, you infect a large population. So this mental model, as it turns out, is, is not just a mental model. It's, it's basically uh, enshrined in most of the mathematical models that we use uh, to, uh, to model the, the spread of uh, biological disease. Uh, and those models, which were developed in the 1920s, uh, were, were in effect ported over to the social sciences uh, in the 1960s. Uh, and, and used to describe uh, the spread of innovations and ideas and other kinds of social processes. But they're really, at heart, uh, 
uh, the same models that were used to describe uh, biological disease. So the reason why I'm bringing this up is that historically, when we look at empirical data about things spreading through a society or a network, we don't see the picture that I just showed you. Somebody sort of fiddling with my sound level here. Let me, one moment I can hear myself echoing, and the next moment I'm, OK. Um, so, uh, so instead, what we see is, is something uh, like, uh, like these pictures here, where uh, in both cases, on the uh, x-axis, uh, we have uh, time. And on the y-axis, we have uh, a, a cumulative uh, count of adoptions aggregated across a whole population. And so here we have uh, the, uh, a, a very famous paper by Coleman, Katz, and Menzel from the, uh, the 1950s where they were uh, studying the diffusion of uh, tetracycline among doctors in the Midwest. And on the right-hand side uh, is Everett Rogers' uh, sort of stylized version of the same plot uh, in his uh, book, Diffusion of Innovations, which I think is, is maybe the most uh, highly cited book ever published in the social sciences. So these are sort of not minor uh, uh, um, examples. These are sort of core canonical uh, representations of how we should, uh, how we can uh, uh, think about empirical diffusion data in a, in a social science context. Uh, and the claim that Rogers makes uh, and that Coleman, Katz, and, Zen, and Menzel made as well uh, is that the, the signature of diffusion here, of, of contagion, is this sort of S-shaped curve, right? So that if you, uh, if you count, uh, if you have some underlying contagion process uh, uh, and you're just counting the number of people who are infected or who have adopted something over a period of time, it, it starts off slowly, and then uh, as you encounter this exponential growth phase, you see these, these curves uh, kick up. And then eventually, uh, you run out of susceptible people uh, and the curve asymptotes. And that's what drives this S-shape in the curve. And the claim is that whenever you see S-shaped curves, you can infer that you have some underlying contagion process. So there are a couple of problems with that, uh, with that inference. Uh, the first uh, is that there are, it turns out, many ways to get S-shaped uh, cumulative adoption curves. Uh, first, there are lots of different contagion processes. We have many different models of contagion now, and they all generate S-shaped curves. So just because you see an S-shaped curve doesn't mean you know what the mechanism is. Uh, and secondly, there are other mechanisms that have no contagion in them at all that can also generate S-shaped curves. So if you just assume some sort of uh, distribution of propensity to adopt over the population, you can get an S-shaped curve, even if there's no interaction between people at all. Uh, and uh, of course, if you uh, introduce any kind of marketing uh, or media uh, into your model, uh, and then almost everything in the social world has one or both of those two things, you can get any shape curve that you want, including an S-shaped one. So the second problem with S-shaped curves uh, is that uh, it is really sort of a selection uh, problem, which is that uh, you know, when social scientists go out to, to study things in the world, they tend to only study interesting things, right? I mean, after all, why would you study uninteresting things? Uh, but the, there's a, a problem here, which is called selection on the dependent variable, which is you're trying to understand you know, why do things spread? Why do some things take off and not others? Uh, but you only see the things that take off. You only notice the books that become uh, bestsellers, the videos that go viral, uh, the people who uh, become successful. Uh, and yet the vast majority of attempts to succeed uh, sort of disappear beneath the waves. Right? And so this is true for diffusion. It's true for success. It's true for most of the things that we're interested in. And so if you only study uh, the things that diffuse, uh, then you'll have a, a very biased sample. And so if we want to really understand uh, you know, what makes things spread and how they spread, um, we have to have a couple of, of, of properties that we would like to satisfy in our data. Uh, one is that um, 
it will be uh, individual level events. So we want to be able to see that you know, a particular person had a particular piece of information and they passed that on to another particular person. And we want to be able to reconstruct these diffusion trees uh, 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 at the individual level, but at scale for a single diffusion event. And then we'd like to have that over an entire population, in, in, in effect like a census of all the things that are trying to spread. So we'd like to be able to study the unsuccessful things as well as the successes. Yeah. How's this? Is that better? OK. So one of the uh, advantages of studying diffusion processes or contagion processes, I'm going to use those words interchangeably, online, uh, is that uh, web data, digital data, uh, is helping us to overcome uh, these two uh, barriers. And so this is, uh, if we, you know, going back just over 10 years now, there's been an increasing number of uh, publications that uh, exploit this class of data. Um, and so once we have data of this sort, we can ask new questions, right? So for example, we can ask, you know, how much of diffusion is really viral, right? Versus some other uh, kind of mechanism. What does it look like? You know, we have this sort of mental model of a, of, a, of a contagion process that I showed you in the first slide. Does anything actually look like that or does it look like something else? What does that tell us about uh, uh, the mechanisms by which things spread uh, online? And finally, can we predict it? You know, if we, if we, this is not quite as good as being able to say what's causing it, uh, but at the very minimum, we should be able, you know, if, we, if we're going to understand the causal mechanisms by which things spread, we should at least be able to identify the features that allow us to predict uh, when things will be successful. And our ability to do that will tell us uh, you know, how much of this is, is, is uh, some sort of deterministic mechanism versus uh, simply randomness. OK, so uh, I'm going to just talk about a few different papers now that, uh, that uh, really uh, dig into these three questions. Uh, the first one uh, is, is work done with uh, Sherrod Goyle and Dan Goldstein back at Yahoo several years ago. Uh, and we were really interested in this question of, you know, how much of diffusion is viral? Like, what do we, we keep sort of, we sort of throw this word around quite casually, um, but we don't really have a sense of, of, you know, of all the stuff that's kind of happening out there online and all of the information that's been exchanged between people how much of this is what we would call viral spreading. And so the way we approached this was to take uh, several other projects that, uh, that either we had worked on in the past or that colleagues of ours at Yahoo had worked on. And these projects were all designed to answer different questions. So for example, uh, you see this little Facebook icon over here. So this was work that was done you know, back in the earlier era of, of Facebook when it was all apps. I don't know if you even remember this time. Before Facebook was a news feed, it was sort of a page where you had all these different apps and these apps you know, would do all kinds of entertaining things for you like you know, generate a map of all the cities that you'd visited or they would compute some, uh, something about your friendship network. Um, so we built an app that would uh, ask you about your uh, political, this could be quite controversial these days actually. Um, this is way more invasive than Cambridge Analytica. Um, we would ask you about your political beliefs, like what do you, you know, what do you believe about, uh, about certain, about immigration or about, um, uh, about uh, redistribution of wealth. These were questions that were taken from the general so social survey. And we would ask you the questions and then we would ask you what you thought your friends would answer. And then we would go ask your friends the same questions. Uh, so we could measure how similar you were to your friends in terms of your political beliefs and also how similar you thought you were. So that was what we were interested in. But in order to gather the data, we wanted to build a sort of viral component into the design of this survey. So we had this, uh, you know, we, would, we would show you a picture of your friend uh, 
Uh, we would ask you a question about your friend, and then uh, if your friend hadn't already answered the question, we would kind of get you to send her uh, an invitation to participate in this game. So there was a, a, a sort of a social referral element built into it, and, and we wanted this thing to sort of snowball out through the, uh, through the Facebook network and, and get us a huge amount of, uh, of data. Um, and so each one of these projects had a similar kind of flavor. It was a different project. You know, this one was a, a, a synchronous video viewing app. This one was a philanthropy project where we were trying to get people to do something nice for someone uh, so through a sort of pay it forward mechanism. Um, we had a bunch of Twitter data. We had uh, six different data sets that uh, were different in terms of scale. They were different uh, in terms of the networks. They were different in terms of the underlying population. They were different in terms of the adoption mechanism. Uh, but they all had some kind of uh, social referral mechanism built into them. Uh, and there was a reason why we wanted to get uh, different uh, uh, data sets, because any given one of them had certain kinds of biases built into it. So you know, back in 2010 or 2009 when we did the, uh, the Facebook uh, experiment, Facebook was a much smaller site. It didn't have two billion people. It had you know, tens of millions of people. Uh, and people often criticized it for, uh, for being very, uh, uh, you, know, you know, very young population, very left-leaning, very unrepresentative of the general population. And you could have made that same criticism about Twitter or any other uh, of, the, uh, of the domains that we looked at. Uh, so the point here was that we, not that we had unbiased data sets, but that we had data sets with very different biases. And so the claim was that if we found similar empirical patterns across all of them, uh, then we would have uh, a better claim on, uh, on, on general validity. And so what we found was actually extremely consistent. Uh, and what I'm showing here are the six different domains. Uh, and in each case, I'm showing you the, the top five most frequent motifs. So these are our... our are structures uh, that appeared in the data that are um, uh, uh, that, that represent the most common diffusion patterns. So just to interpret that, it's hard for me to read the screen here with all the glare. But this is the up here we had. Uh, this was about 40 million uh, instances uh, in which somebody had introduced a shortened URL into Twitter. And so this little dot here. Uh, the, uh, is saying that 93% uh, of the time when somebody introduces a, a shortened URL, uh, it receives zero retweets. Right? So 93% of the time, you tweet something and nobody pays attention. Right? So that's uh, you know, by far the most common uh, uh, occurrence. Uh, the second most common occurrence is about 5% of the time, you get one retweet. Uh, about 0.9% of the time, you get two retweets. 0.3% of the time, you get three retweets. And then 0.3% of the time, this little thing over here happens where one of your followers retweets your tweet, and then one of their followers who's not one of your followers retweets it. So that uh, looks a little bit like uh, social contagion. But if you're adding up these numbers here, you'll see that these top five uh, motifs account for about 99% of everything that happens on Twitter, right? at least in our data set of 40 million. Uh, URLs. And in fact, that pattern uh, generalizes very robustly to all uh, of the other five domains. So there's six different domains. Each one has five top uh, most frequent motifs. So there's 30 possible structures that we could have seen in our data, and we only saw seven. Right? So these five here, plus this one and this one. Right, so that's basically everything that happens uh, in 99% of the events that we observe in any one of these six domains. And that led us to further aggregate uh, the data. So now this is showing all of the data put together. So across all six domains, we can conclude that about 90% of the time uh, when somebody introduces a potentially contagious thing into a social network, 90% of the time, nothing happens. 8% uh, of the time, you get one additional adoption. 
2% of the time, uh, sorry, 1% of the time you get uh, two additional adoptions, and 1% of the time is everything else, right? So in effect, everything you've ever heard of, every successful diffusion event, every cat video, every, um, uh, every uh, you know, uh, uh, um, hit song or whatever, all of those events fall into this tiny blue bar on the right here. So that's this sort of first claim here, that 99% uh, of events involve fewer than two, uh, uh, two or fewer viral adoptions. Now, if you're, if you're parsing this carefully, you might wonder what else is buried in that small blue bar on the right. Uh, that, uh, so going back to the disease metaphor from earlier, uh, the, uh, about 100 years ago, uh, there was a, a pandemic uh, that's uh, now referred to as the Spanish flu. And it was a, a strain of influenza that uh, spread in the, uh, at the very end of World War I uh, and infected about a billion people worldwide, which was about a third of the world's population at the time. Now, that event in our language would character would, would qualify as a single event, right? But if you were counting the number of infections of individuals over all of history, a much larger uh, fraction of them would be in that one event, right? So one billion uh, uh, adoptions for one event. Uh, and so this is a, a common uh, property of, of, uh, of, of uh, natural distributions, which often have this scale-free uh, feature where the, the, the uh, events that are out in the tail of the distribution account for a much larger fraction of, the, you know, of some other property, like at cost, for example. And so if you think about uh, avalanches or forest fires or storms, the, the events that are uh, the largest events, even though they're extremely rare, uh, account for a, a large fraction of um, the number of people affected or the cost of the, uh, the, the total cost associated with, with those events. And so we can actually make a stronger statement uh, with respect to these data, which is that there is nothing like the Spanish flu in any of the data, right? So rather than counting events, we can now count adoptions and we can conclude that 99% of all the adoptions are within one hop of the seed node. So if your model of viral is something that is multi-step, then 99% of everything that we observe would not qualify as viral, right? So this is now able to put a, a very, very low lid on the amount of viral stuff that's happening. So that was the first big surprising result, right? If you, so we have this impression that there's a lot of, of uh, of, of interesting stuff that is viral in the world, and it turns out that you know whatever that is, it's uh, accounting for only a tiny fraction of, of all the things that are spreading. But of course, you might think, well, um, I don't care because <laughs> I know these things happen, and those are the most interesting things. So, uh, uh, you know, why aren't you finding any of them? Uh, and now this, of course, is a few years old now, but uh, Gangnam Style was uh, the first video that forced YouTube to increase the number of digits uh, in its counter because it, uh, uh, it, it uh, exceeded uh, a billion downloads and probably has a few billion now. So this is, you know, you would think clearly a viral video, right? And so in some sense, you know, one of the reactions that we got when we, when we published this paper was, well, you know, you just sort of weren't looking at the interesting stuff, right? That there's clearly stuff that's out there that's really, really viral, and somehow that wasn't in your data, and you were looking at uninteresting things, and of course, because they were all uninteresting, you didn't see anything viral. So that, of course, raised a different question for us, which is, well, we know that Gangnam Style happened. We know that it got a couple of billion downloads. But we don't actually know that it was a viral phenomenon. It's something that we refer to as a viral phenomenon, but all we really know is that it got a couple of billion downloads. Now, you know, the Super Bowl is also a very popular event. About 100 million people watch the Super Bowl every year. 
but nobody would refer to the Super Bowl as a viral phenomenon, right? It's a, it's a broadcast phenomenon. It's something that everybody knows about, everybody tunes in at the same time, uh, and everybody watches it. Uh, there's nothing viral about it at all. And so the same could be true of Gangnam Style. It could be true that, uh, uh, that and in fact it was true that Gangnam Style was uh, when it became popular, it was featured on the front page of most of the major web portals. You know, the, we were at Yahoo at the time, and uh, it was on the front page of Yahoo, which has about 100 million daily visitors. And so many of those downloads could have been driven uh, by events that look like this thing over on the right-hand side, which is just a single node in the middle blasting out to a huge number of, uh, of individuals who are just at one degree of separation and nothing like this at all, right? Or maybe it could have been like this, we just don't know. So what we, to resolve that question and also to resolve the, uh, the other criticism that we received about, you know, you just didn't look at enough interesting stuff, uh, we went back, uh, by this stage we were at Microsoft and this is work now again with Sherrod Goyle but also Ashton Anderson and Jake Hoffman and we just gathered a lot more data. This was sort of, you know, you can never really prove that, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, uh, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. I always have to remind myself how that one goes. But, um, but uh, just because we didn't see something interesting in our data doesn't mean that we could prove that such things didn't happen, right? So how do you resolve that problem? Well, you just go get more data. So this time, uh, we took uh, everything, uh, every tweet on Twitter that contained a link to a video, a news story, an image, or a petition uh, over the course of an entire year. Right? So this is uh, over a billion observations, and we're almost guaranteed that if anything interesting or viral happened on Twitter in the course of an entire year, then it would be in our data set. Uh, at least anything that linked to a URL. So then to uh, avoid the criticism that we were looking at things that were never designed to spread in the first place, right? So it's possible that you know, you're posting something to Twitter, but you're just putting it up there for yourself or for a couple of friends, and you, you never, uh, you know, there was no sort of viral intent, then maybe it's unfair to count, uh, to say that it, it's a failure to spread means that things don't go viral. So the way we dealt with that concern was to first restrict uh, this very large population of URLs only to things that received uh, at least 100 retweets. Okay, so 100 retweets actually a, a lot, right? I, I think maybe, uh, you know, in 10 years of posting things to Twitter, I maybe you know, once or twice have gotten 100 retweets for something, okay? Um, that's way more than anything I showed you on the previous slide. And in fact, only about one in 3,000 uh, tweets gets uh, in excess of 100 retweets. So these are already very rare events, but because we have over a billion events to begin with, we have about 350,000 of these rare events. And so from now on, we're just going to talk about those. So we're already in the, in the realm of, of, of popular things, very, very popular things. And now for these popular things, we can ask, what do they look like? What is the structure of a viral thing, right? of, of a thing that we call viral? Um, and what we're going to do here is imagine that one of these events happens. Somebody tweets something. It gets a bunch of retweets, at least 100. And then it stops. Everything is over. Now, in the course of, of getting all of those retweets, imagine that you, you, know, you have this sort of underlying network of the follower graph of Twitter. And every time somebody retweets uh, uh, this particular URL, their node lights up. And so you now have this uh, like skeleton uh, that has been left behind through this cascade of retweets. Right? So that's the network. Right? We have a, a retweet network that is a small portion of the total follower graph of Twitter that has been activated uh, by this particular cascade. And so now we want to measure some property of that network. So if it's a broadcast, if one person re uh, tweeted something, 
and a bunch of their followers retweeted them and then nothing else happened, then the average shortest path length of that network is going to be very close to two, right? Because all of the nodes in the bottom here will be two steps from each other, connected through the, the center. And then the center is going to be, of course, one step from everybody. So the average will be a little less than two. But as that number becomes large, then it will approach two. OK, so the, the minimum that we will get from a large broadcast is going to be asymptotically close to two. And then if we have one of these multi-generational uh, branching processes, something that looks like our mental model of a viral event, uh, then uh, the depth of that tree is going to be proportional to log of n, where n is the total number of nodes uh, in the cascade. And therefore, the average shortest path length is also going to be proportional to log n. So for every one of these 350,000 events or cascades, we can compute some number, which is the average shortest path length. And it's going to be between, roughly speaking, 2 and log of n. And so now that we have these numbers, we can ask uh, you know, about their distribution. So in particular, we can ask how much diversity do we see with respect to structure? And so are popular things mostly viral in this structural sense, or are they mostly broadcasts? Or are they some sort of combination of the two? You might imagine that you know, truly viral things need to have a little bit of broadcast and a little bit of virality. You can sort of make up any story that you want. Uh, and then we can ask, well, how does that change as we go from things that are merely popular to things that are super popular, things that have 100 uh, retweets up to things that have tens of thousands of retweets? Does, do, do they get more broadcasty or more viral? So to answer the first question, uh, you know, whatever uh, story you came up with about the, the relative importance of virality and broadcastiness, Somewhere in the data, that story is true, right? That there is almost an endless variety of structures. Uh, it's really sort of like a, you know, a menagerie uh, of, 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 uh, of, of cascades uh, in this data. Uh, and uh, this is a uh, selection of six randomly sampled uh, cascades uh, where we have binned everything by uh, structural virality, and then randomly picked one example from each bin, uh, and ranked everything from uh, from left to right and to uh, and top to bottom in terms of increasing structural virality. So, so this thing on the top left here, which looks like a black triangle, is really a big broadcast. It just looks like a triangle because all the lines have been drawn on top of each other. This is just one uh, node here at the top. I think it's a CNN. And there's some CNN article, uh, and I'll, you know, CNN has lots of followers, and so uh, a bunch of them retweeted it, and then not very much happened. They have these little sort of, it looks like some sort of uh, wet paint has been dribbling down here. There's been a few little uh, additional retweets, but the vast majority of the retweeting is from people who follow uh, the original source. And then as you go from uh, 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 left to right and top to bottom. And I should just note here, um, all of these cascades have approximately the same number of nodes in them. Right? So they're all about the same popularity. They all have about the same number of retweets. But as you can see, uh, the, uh, the number of retweets that are in the largest broadcast, uh, the, the percentage of retweets that's in the largest broadcast is, is going down. So we go from something that's very, very broadcasty to something that's, that looks very viral down here. We have many generations, and at each generation, only a few, uh, uh, in, in most cases, uh, a few uh, uh, retweets at each branch. So this is sort of a pretty viral, in the classical sense, event down here. And that's, uh, this was actually, I think, a, uh, a New York Times uh, obituary about a French freedom fighter who was you know, over 100 years old and had uh, was sort of the real life version of the world's most interesting man. He had sort of, you know, escaped three times from the Nazis and you know, flown fighter bombers and done all kinds of crazy things in his life. But he was a he was not a famous person. He wasn't someone that anyone had heard of. So when his obituary was published, it wasn't sort of a big deal. But it was such an interesting story uh, that uh, I remembered reading it and then 
uh, you know, months later we did this analysis and uh, it turns out other people had also found it very interesting because they were, they were retweeting it to their friends. So that's the first message is that there's this sort of tremendous uh, diversity of, of cascades that were all approximately the same size. So the structure uh, is very different. Uh, the second thing to note uh, is that if you, if you were measuring things in the uh, Coleman, Katzen, Menzel style, uh, you were just counting total number of retweets as a function of time, uh, all of these things would look basically the same. Right? So very little uh, variation on the, on the surface and then tremendous uh, differences um, uh, under, uh, uh, under the surface. Okay, now how does this picture change as, uh, as we go from merely popular to very popular? So here uh, we're going to uh, really focus not so much on the diversity, uh, although that's still present, as on the central tendency. So these now are box plots uh, that are binned by size and broken down by domain. So we have uh, petitions, news articles, pictures, and videos, which are the four things that we collected. And in, the, uh, in these box plots, the, the, the thick black uh, horizontal lines uh, represent the median, the boxes are the interquartile range, and the dots represent the full uh, extent of the data. And so you can see the diversity is still here, right? That, that there is a tremendous range of, uh, of structure uh, uh, for every one of these bins, but the median is really not changing very much at all. And in fact, for, for pictures and videos, the correlation is almost exactly zero, which is extremely rare uh, in, uh, you know, in my experience to get a correlation that's so close to zero. There's really no variation at all uh, in the central tendency. So what's going on here? Basically, uh, the size of the cascade is being driven by the size of the largest broadcast in the cascade. So most of what's happening, uh, you know, even though we have all of this diversity, uh, most of the, you know, the bulk of the action is really, is really in the broadcasts, right? So uh, this is, uh, you know, a, a function of the, the scale freeness, really, of the Twitter follower graph. So if the the most, I don't know, who's the most followed person on, is it still Katy Perry? I, I lost track. It used to be just, it was Justin Bieber at the time. We called this the Justin Bieber effect, but now it's the Katy Perry effect or whatever. So he has about 100 million followers on Twitter. So this is, you know, really Super Bowl numbers, right? And so, and, uh, and so when one of these uh, 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 celebrities, and they're almost all celebrities, um, retweet something, you know, even if the, even if the, they're, percentage retweet rate is extremely low, uh, they can get a massive burst of attention. Um, and that's basically what's happening here, is that everything is dying out all the time, that this sort of, the, the, the nothing is viral picture that I showed you earlier is still true, um, but, it's, um, but it's augmented by, uh, by this uh, occasional, uh, you know, bomb blast that happens when one of these ultra high followed, uh, high follower individuals uh, retweets something. So what can we learn about, you know, the sort of general topic of contagion by looking at this class of data? Well, the first thing is that it really sort of causes us to rethink uh, the, the theoretical literature. So, you know, we have a, a long history of, of models of, of contagion. Uh, and one of the main uh, foci of that literature has been on the uh, epidemic threshold or the tipping point. This sort of, uh, if you imagine uh, some parameter that controls the infectiousness of a disease, uh, when that parameter is very low, uh, then everything uh, dies out. And then once you pass uh, uh, this epidemic threshold, you go from, uh, uh, diseases that are dying out before they infect more than a negligible fraction of the population to things that start growing exponentially, right? And so this is a, a very well-studied phase transition that happens in lots of these models. 
And if you're, a, uh, if you're an epidemiologist, you want to keep your disease below this phase transition. And if you're a marketer, you want to get it above the phase transition. Uh, but everybody, uh, uh, the, there's been a lot of focus in this theoretical literature on, on this transition and, and what are the parameters that, uh, that determine it. And what we find in all of this empirical data is that that transition is basically irrelevant. That like everything that we are seeing is happening well below the transition point, well below the phase transition. And so if we want to understand social contagion, we really have to be sort of thinking about this subcritical regime where everything is just dying out all the time. Uh, and the only thing uh, that is counteracting the dying out in this is, uh, is the occasional hub. So this will, you know, th this should, uh, it's not so much that the models are wrong, it's that we need to be looking at the models in a different parameter regime than where we are currently looking. And finally, uh, the other uh, insight uh, that I think is worth emphasizing, maybe uh, in this crowd we don't need to emphasize it, uh, is that you know, even though people have, I think, uh, maybe overhyped the, uh, the notion of big data, there are very well uh, defined uh, questions, or there, there are certainly types of questions uh, for which the scale of the data is extremely useful. And, and one of them is in the study of rare events. So if you're, if you're interested in understanding things that only happen sort of once, uh, you know, uh, out of every few thousand events, uh, then, then getting a billion observations is not necessarily overkill. Okay, so the final thing that I want to talk about is prediction, um, which sort of is the, as close as we can get, at least with observational data, to, to talking about uh, mechanisms and causality. So this is an example of a tweet um, by Neil deGrasse Tyson, and this is in 2016, uh, and he's celebrating the 100th anniversary of Einstein's prediction about uh, gravity waves. So how many retweets do you think this is going to get? I mean, is this an interesting tweet? Would you retweet this? How would you even think about that, right? Well, Neil deGrasse Tyson is like a pretty famous guy. I wouldn't have said this was a especially titillating or interesting <laughs> tweet. But anyway, he got 21,000, almost 22,000 retweets and 35,000 likes. So how would you predict that? Uh, and, and what's driving it exactly? Did, you know, is it just turn out maybe Einstein is like lots of people are fascinated by Einstein. You know, the, the gravity, the LIGO uh, discovery had just been announced. Uh, so, you know, maybe uh, it was LIGO that got people so interested in this. Like, what's the kind of, uh, you know, secret source here? Like, if we were uh, trying to explain uh, why this thing got so many, I mean, this is a lot more retweets than any of us. I expect have ever gotten for anything. Um, uh, you know, how do you, if you wanted to get that many retweets for something, what would you do? Do you just become Neil deGrasse Tyson? Is that, how, you know, that's like, but maybe, okay? So this was a question that, uh, that a few of us asked uh, quite a while ago. Um, this is work with Eitan Bakshi, who's now at Facebook, and Winter Mason, who's also now at Facebook, and Jake Hoffman who's at Microsoft Research. And we were really interested in this question of like, well, what can we predict? If we, if we have all the data that we can get from Twitter, how well can we predict just how many retweets something's gonna get? Like forget of all this sort of structural virality stuff. I just wanna predict the total number of retweets. So we had, uh, uh, at the time, a large sample of, of cascades from about a million users, uh, and we built some, you know, at the time, fairly complicated machine learning models uh, to try to predict cascade size. Uh, and the best thing we could do was an R squared of about a third. So we could predict uh, about one third of the observed uh, variance. Uh, and this was with a lot of data and a lot of features on our observations and some state-of-the-art machine learning models. But even more sort of discouraging than that result is that almost all of the predictive power uh, 
came from a single feature. So if we just went back to this example here and said, all you need to know is if you have a history of Neil deGrasse Tyson's tweets, you just compute the average number of retweets that he got in the past, and that's your prediction. Like, that model is as good as the best model that you can build. Like, not quite as good, but for all intents and purposes, it's as good, right? So a simple linear model with one feature is as good as the best machine learning model you can build. Not surprisingly, all our machine learning colleagues were unimpressed with that result, and they decided that they could do better. And so we have a bunch of papers that were published uh, over the next several years that seem to do better, right? So if you read the text under these articles, they seem like they're improving uh, on our somewhat pessimistic conclusion. I mean, we basically said, well, it's really hard, there's not much you can predict, and there's no point using fancy models. Um, and so these seem to be much more impressive results. And so in 2016 or 2015, we decided to revisit the topic, and we had uh, a very talented uh, intern, uh, Travis Martin, with us at Microsoft Research. And um, so we said, okay, why don't you go and read this literature that has come out since 2011 on this topic, you know, just predicting retweets on Twitter, very well-defined uh, 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 question, and, and draw a little plot, right? Where we just see, you know, on the x-axis is time, or, or you know, and then on the y-axis is performance. I just, we just are curious, like, we, we assume performance has gone up, but, you know, how, how far, how's it gone? You know, is, it, is, it, is it going up linearly? Is it, is it going up in a, in a concave or a convex manner? Like, what does this plot look like? How much progress are we actually making? And, uh, and a few weeks later, Travis came back and he said, I, I can't draw the plot. And we were like, well, you must have, we really must have uh, overestimated this guy. We thought he was smart. <laughs> um, but, uh, but we looked at it, and it turns out that he, was, he couldn't. It was impossible to draw this plot. And the reason was that all of these papers were measuring different things. Even though it seems like a very simple, you know, retweets on Twitter, right? How simple could it get? But it turns out there's lots of ways to do that. And so uh, last year we, we, um, we uh, did a little reanalysis of the data uh, and we constructed what uh, Andrew Goldman calls the Garden of Forking Paths. And in Goldman's uh, language, what he's talking about is you, if you have a a sort of high-level research question, uh, the process of getting from the high-level research question to the sort of eventual statistical test that you publish in your paper involves a series of decisions. It involves a series of decisions about data processing, about you know, you know, discarding outliers, about thresholding things, about you know, theoretical constructs that you're going to measure, uh, about your performance metric, the model that you choose. Uh, there's a whole series of decisions that you have to make, and at every one of those decision points, you could imagine uh, a fork in the path uh, where you could have made a different decision or, or possibly several different decisions. And so if you imagine this sort of hypothetical, um, the set of all possible decisions that you might have made, it, uh, it, it is a, a, a forking path or, or a garden of forking paths, and your paper is one leaf node on that branching tree. And Goldman, of course, is bringing this up in the context of, of uh, the replication crisis, that if you can sort of go through this tree many, this garden many times until you find a leaf node where you get a significant result, uh, then uh, it's unlikely that that result is going to replicate. Um, now, we thought possibly the same thing is happening in machine learning exercises, right? So it's not just in you know, experimental design, but even just sort of analyzing data uh, and, 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 and doing prediction tasks, you could have a similar thing going on. And so what this picture shows uh, 
is that remarkably, and this sounds almost impossible uh, that it could be true, but for the same data set and the same model, right? This is exactly the same model. Just by making uh, 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 choices about uh, your prediction to actually, I take that back, it can't be the same model. The, reg the regression model is the same model. Classification model is the same model. Oh, no, wait, it is a regression model. We're just thresholding, right? So yes, so same, same data set, same model, but just changing the prediction task, picking a different evaluation metric, and then uh, deciding what to threshold on, right? Because you have, at some point, you know, in a classification task, you have to say, well, I, I want to uh, predict things that are successful versus not successful. What do you mean by successful? And so that's a threshold. In a, in a, uh, in a regression task, uh, uh, you might, uh, you, you may want to filter out, and people often do this. They say, well, you know, uh, all the data is at, you know, n equals one, right? So that, if, if I just, if I, I, I want to throw that out because I, I care about predicting the tail of the distribution, right? So people make different decisions about where to threshold. And just by making different decisions at these three levels, you can get very, very different answers. In fact, our answer uh, that we had reached in 2011 is totally consistent with some of these much more uh, uh, impressive sounding claims. For example, accuracy, very easy to achieve high accuracy in an imbalanced set, um, in an imbalanced classification task because you know, most things don't succeed. So, we can show that depending on the choices that you make in your analysis, you can get uh, a, a, a wide range of, of qualitatively different sounding results. And so when you just look at the literature and you see these different claims, you actually have no idea uh, uh, how to compare them. So to revisit this task again, we. Uh, and of course, the amount of data on Twitter is increasing exponentially. So you know, every, every time, the, the previous paper, we had 1.4 billion tweets from an entire year. And now it's 1.4 billion tweets from just one month. So it's an amazing sort of increase in the volume here. Uh, so now we're just trying to predict uh, how many retweets uh, appear in a cascade. Uh, we have, uh, again, tweets containing URLs. We do a whole bunch of pre-processing. Um, we end up with 850 million tweets from 50 million users from a bunch of different domains. Um, I won't get into all the details. Lots and lots of features. So you know, not, not only do we have more data now, but we also have more features on all of the data, uh, including uh, the for some subset of users, uh, we have all the lists that they appear on. Uh, and so we have a very good way of classifying uh, what type of users they are. So we can look at uh, uh, the, uh, we can, you know, if, if you appear on 100 lists, you know, if, if 100 different people have created lists of the flavor data scientist and included you on those lists, you're very, very likely a data scientist, right? Or that's how the world thinks of you. Um, so these, these uh, user-generated lists are extremely good ways of classifying uh, at least the subset of users who are sort of well-known enough to appear on, on such lists. So we can use the list to classify the users, and then we can look at all the tweets by people who we have classified, and we can then uh, characterize the content of those tweets. So what we're interested in doing here, and this, this is a uh, was motivated by some responses that we got to the previous paper, is that you might think that if you're known as a data scientist and you tweet about data science, so for example, Neil, Neil deGrasse Tyson is a physicist. So maybe the reason why he's getting lots of retweets tweeting about Einstein is he's a physicist tweeting about physics. But if Neil deGrasse Tyson was tweeting about, you know, going to the zoo with his daughter, like maybe that wouldn't get any retweets, right? So this sort of, effectively, this is an interaction effect between the topic of what you're tweeting about and the user. So anyway, we can put all of this stuff 
into our even fancier model now, and what do we find? So this is the overall result. We have a series of models of increasing complexity. Uh, some of these models have uh, just content. Others have uh, just user data. Others have user and content data. And then finally, the sort of kitchen sink model has you know, everything plus the interaction terms. And uh, what we're showing you here is the R squared as we go from very simple to increasingly complex uh, models. So interestingly, and this was a result that we got in the first paper as well, uh, and this is sort of always very surprising to people, the content features are really not predictive at all. Right? So you, you might think that, that what makes something go viral is the sort of cleverness of the content Maybe that's true, but it certainly doesn't show up in any of the, uh, in any of the data that we have. Uh, the user features matter much more. Uh, and then after that, uh, it's, uh, it, 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 there's very little uh, additional value. So uh, if we add all of this together, we, our R squared is a little bit better than the 0.34 that we got six years earlier, um, but not much. And the same uh, result holds where a simple linear model that has one feature, which is the past performance of the seed node, so this is the, you know, Neil deGrasse Tyson's average number of retweets, uh, is that's the, uh, that's the dashed line here. So you can see how much benefit you get from your fancy machine learning model. Um, actually, you can't really see it. Um, <laughs> So, oh, that just says all the things that I just said. Okay, so how do we understand this? So we thought about, um, you know, what's going on, um, and can we kind of generalize a little bit from uh, the specific context? Um, so, pick your example. Let's let, let's stick with 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 cascades on Twitter. Um, you know, if you just look at the raw data, the empirical data, uh, in, in a lot of such contexts, you, you see something that looks like this, which is a, uh, uh, and, and let's imagine this is a, a log scale here on success. So you have some distribution of success uh, where, you know, most things don't do very well, and then you have this long tail uh, of, of, of extremely successful, uh, a small fraction of extremely successful things. And then you ask, well, why is that? Right? And so the, the sort of naive or common sense uh, explanation is, well, some things are just better than other things, right? And you know, maybe we didn't know that they were better before they happened. You know, the eight uh, uh, children's book publishers who rejected J.K. Rowling's original Harry Potter uh, manuscript certainly didn't know that it was going to become the best-selling fiction book of all time. Uh, but maybe they would, you know, you know, maybe they were stupid, maybe they weren't stupid, but they just sort of, they didn't know, they, you know, they didn't know the, the awesomeness feature, right? That there's this sort of uh, quality that we often uh, invoke to describe successful things, which we call the awesomeness feature. And, um, you know, Harry Potter's just awesome. That's why it's so successful, right? Um, now, clearly, they didn't know that, but maybe if they had you know, if we'd asked different people at the time, if we'd had our sort of awesomeness wand, we could have held it up to the manuscript and it would have gone to 11. And then we would know that, uh, that Harry Potter was going to be super successful. So let's imagine that we have this sort of model of the world here where Q is awesomeness, right? Or skill or, 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 or whatever talent, whatever you want to call it, quality. But let's just call it awesomeness. And F is some mapping between awesomeness and success. That's the deterministic part of, of, uh, well, of the world. Um, and then in addition to that, there's just random noise, which we're going to call luck. Right? So the success of, of a tweet or of Harry Potter or of any of Star Wars, any other thing that you want to uh, uh, talk about, is some combination of these two things. It has to be. That's everything, right? There's skill and there's luck. And so you can imagine uh, 
going from the world that we observe, which is the top, to the world that we could observe if only we could correctly condition on awesomeness, right? So in a, in a skill world, a world where the reason why some things do well is because they're just better than others, if we, were, if, we, if we could perfectly measure this Q and we knew the mapping, the F, between Q and success, then we would be able to decompose this distribution into this family of distributions, right? And once you correctly condition on Q, then all the variance goes away, right? So there's like a tiny little bit of luck, right, which is, which is the, you know, the, there's, there's not zero, these are not spikes, right? They're like little, you know, the very, very uh, narrow distributions. But once we condition on Q, then there's just a little bit of random variation around that mean. And almost all of the variance is in the Q, okay? But there's another possible world, which is what we call luck world, where you do the same thing, you're still measuring Q perfectly, you still have F, you know exactly how the world works. It just turns out that how the world works is it's mostly luck, right? And so here, the very best thing, the distribution of the very best thing mostly overlaps with the distribution of the very worst thing. And most of the variance is, is within Q, okay? So we can be quantitative about that and we can say, all right, I want to measure the amount by which my variance decreases after I condition on Q, right? And it turns out that this is just one minus R squared, right? So that's really what R squared is telling us, is if we had the perfect model, right, if we, if we actually like knew how the world worked, then the R squared for that, one minus the R squared for that model would be uh, the amount that we are in, um, uh, luck world. Did I get that around the right way? Basically, as R squared goes to one, if we had a perfect model of the world, and we were in a pure skill world, then our model would have an R squared of one. We could deterministically predict success, right? And in a pure luck world, it wouldn't matter what model we had. You, have, you could know absolutely everything about how everything worked, and your R squared would still go to zero. Okay, is that clear? Okay, so empirically, we're at like 0.4. Okay, so we're sort of more towards uh, luck world than skill world, and that's the claim that we've been making in all of these papers. Now, of course, the response that we get to all of these claims is, well, your model sucks, or your data sucks, right, or both, right? You're not, you don't have a good enough model, you're not using deep learning, um, you know, you didn't, you know, you didn't measure the interaction effect, so there's just, there's, you know, one can always object, right? One can always say, well, the reason why your R squared is so bad is because you didn't have this feature in your model, or because you didn't have enough kind of nonlinearity, um, you didn't have enough data, you didn't have the right type of data. So uh, there's no way to kind of get around this objection. I mean, you can sort of keep trying harder and harder and get more data and more features and and fancier models, and, um, but you know, maybe there's a whole other class of models uh, that we don't even know about. Okay, so we're gonna try to do an end run around this whole argument and say, let's simulate a world where we know everything, right? So we're gonna create a world that looks a little bit like things spreading on Twitter, but in this world we have perfect knowledge of Q and f of q, right? So there's, uh, in theory, we should be able, you know, whatever, we can eliminate all of the error that comes from our model, okay? So we create this scale-free network, we can't build something as big as Twitter and still hold it in memory, but we can get something that's pretty big. And then we simulate billions of cascades on this thing, okay? And then we compute exactly this quantity, right? So this is, this is now R squared on the simulated data, right? So this is, how we, this is how we get a perfect model, right? Is that we don't, 
we don't actually run a regression model on the data, right? That would, because then our model would have, you know, potentially introduced more error. This is like just the variance on the data itself, okay? So we condition on, we know, we know the, uh, well, oh, I haven't said what Q is yet. So we know two things. The only two things that we can know is where does it start? So we have the seed user, and the only parameter that the seed user has, because it's a random scale-free graph, is degree, okay? So that's, we know everything about the user. That's uh, U, and then we, we have a very simple uh, SIR model, and so the only parameter is R0, which is how many, uh, how many uh, on average, how many uh, uh, new infectives do you generate for each uh, infected person, okay? So we have one parameter for the model, one parameter for the user, and so now we can condition on both of those things. So this is our perfect model. So you might think, well, how could you ever get anything other than R squared equals one? Like you, you're sort of conditioning on, on everything that you, there's, there's zero unknowns here. Um, but what we can do is vary two things. One is we can vary the heterogeneity of the content, right? So now R0 is our, is our sort of proxy for how infectious, how viral, how awesome is the content. And we're not guaranteeing, you know, presumably the distribution of things that are happening in the world varies with respect to that parameter, right? Some things are more interesting, more viral than others. So we're going to allow that distribution to be heterogeneous, okay? So we can go from a world in which not only do we know everything about everything, but everything is exactly the same, right? So a completely homogeneous world where all things are equally interesting or uninteresting to a world in which there's some distribution so that's the first thing we're going to vary. And the second thing we're going to vary is we have some measurement error. So we, we have our awesomeness wand uh, or meter, and we can hold it up to something. And now it gives us the, the true value plus some noise. OK? What new features? Sorry. Yeah. Well, all we so we're we're making a we're making an ex ante prediction, right? So, and by that I mean. You can only measure things that exist before the cascade happens, right? So you can't, you can't condition on, you know, three generations of the cascade, right? You just, so all you can measure is I know where it starts and I know how good it is or how interesting it is, right? And so we know those things perfectly, but once it starts, it just goes, right? So, but, the, but that network is fixed, okay? So we're just gonna drop things in uh, to this network, you know, uh, several billion times and see what happens, right? So we're not, we're, not creating, we're not creating any new features, but maybe what you're getting at is that once things start spreading, stuff can happen, right? And actually, that is exactly what happens, right? And there is, so there's some randomness that comes from whatever realization of the contagion process, right? That there's a bunch of coins being flipped as you kind of go through the network, and that bit we're not controlling, right? Um, and in fact, that is where all the action is, right? So what do we, what do we have here? So let's imagine that we have so we start off in a, in, a, in a homogeneous world where everything is exactly the same. And that's where, that's here. So you can see that in this very, very simple world where we know everything about ex ante, right? We have perfect knowledge of the interestingness. We have perfect knowledge of, uh, of the user 
and everything is exactly the same, then we have a pretty good, we're getting pretty close to R squared of, of one, right? So we have very good predictive power, right? But interestingly, even just allowing things to vary dramatically reduces our R squared, right? So this is a, a very sort of counterintuitive point, but basically we have some average R squared, right? And now there's a distribution around that average and we're just drawing, uh, we're drawing from that distribution. Now, we, we know what it is, we know what the number is, but the larger the R squared, sorry, yes, the la sorry, the larger the R zero, not the R squared, there's too many R's here. But the R, this is all standard terminology, unfortunately. The R zero, like as it gets bigger, you get, you get bigger cascades, okay? So, uh, so they also introduce more variance, right? So as you go from a homogeneous world to a heterogeneous world, you get a, a small fraction of, of things that are more interesting, and those things tend to generate larger cascades, but also reduce your R squared, because there's more, you know, the more uh, generations you go through, the more, the bigger the cascade is, the more coins you're flipping, and so the more uh, potential for random variation there is. So just that effect alone can push you all the way down to an R squared of 0.2, right? This is in an extremely simple world. Something similar is true for uh, error, right? Measurement error. In fact, the, the effects of measurement error are even more dramatic. So if you go from a world of perfect knowledge to uh, just a little bit of measurement error, uh, then your R squared also drops off dramatically. Um, so of course, in the real world, we expect both of these, we, we're, we're certain that there's heterogeneity and we're always going to be stuck with some kind of measurement error. So even just sort of very, even in a very simple uh, context where it's just a, a network and an SIR process spreading on the network, if you introduce any amount of heterogeneity and any amount of estimation error, you very quickly get to an R squared that is very close to what we have, which is about 0.4, right? So, we can't prove anything, but what we're arguing is that this empirical result that we're, you know, where we seem to be kind of nudging up against some kind of ceiling uh, at an R squared of around 0.4, may actually be a fundamental limit, right? That there, are, uh, that there are limits to predictiveness in, a, in contagion processes that arise not because your model is bad or your data is bad, but just because the, the system itself is intrinsically unpredictable, okay? So this is a result that, you know, Matt and I worked on many years ago when we, uh, we looked at the popularity of, of music in an experimental setting and we found a similar kind of result where you know, if you just rerun, rerun the world over and over again, you get different results and uh, about half of the variation and success uh, cannot be uh, eliminated by conditioning on anything that you might be able to measure, okay? So we're finding a similar result here in observational data and in simulations. Uh, and, you know, you could argue that, that, you know, studying cascades on Twitter is really a, almost a best case scenario that you, you know, as far as complex social systems go, you know, retweets on Twitter is pretty simple. Right? Like compared to almost anything else that you might be interested in, this is a very, very simple system about which we have a tremendous amount of data, both in terms of number of observations and also features on each of the observations. So if there, if there were an in, a, a context or a case where you thought you could do pretty well at prediction, this would be it, okay? And, and I think, honestly, that's why people study it, because they think they can do really well. So if there's a fundamental limit 
to predicting cascades on Twitter, then there's probably similar limits for most complex systems. Um, and you know, in some ways, this is not surprising, right? Like if you if you you know think about rolling a die, like you cannot, like you know, in some sense, a perfect prediction for rolling a die would be I have a one sixth chance of rolling any side, right? Like that's you know, for a fair die, that's like pretty close to a perfect prediction. But it's not a very good prediction, right? It doesn't tell you which side of the die is going to, you know, show up on any, you know, the thing that you care about as a gambler is like, well, what's it going to be, right? Being told that it's like one sixth probability of each side is completely useless to the gambler. Like, he already knows that. Um, so, um, so, you know, in some sense, what this is telling us is that, uh, is that you know, outcomes in complex social systems are more like the roll of a die than the return of Halley's Comet, which is sort of an almost perfectly deterministic system for which we can expect uh, something like an R squared close to one. So, uh, you know, this has implications both for computer science and for social science. On the computer science side of things, like we don't really have a good language for talking about this. Like we don't have like, you know, give me the set of features of your system and I'll tell you what the theoretical prediction limit is for your system. Like that, I, I'm not aware of any, uh, of any you know, uh, framework for evaluating, for answering these kinds of questions. Um, and from the social science side, once we know what that limit is, how does that change the kinds of explanations that we, uh, that we think are satisfying, right? That, you know, often when we ask these why questions about things that happen in the world, we ask them as if we want to know the answer, right? We, we, we do want to know the answer, right? Like, we, well, we ask them as if we think there's an answer, right? Like, why did the financial crisis happen? What's the answer? Tell me. Like, what is the deterministic mechanism that caused the financial crisis, right? We ask questions like this all the time. If this is true, then the answer is we don't know and we can't know, right? Now this, for many people, is a very unsatisfying response, but it would completely change how we think about explanation in social science if it turns out that this is really the norm rather than just some sort of extreme case. How much time do I have? Let me just keep going. All right. Okay. So. I'm, I'm sort of done with the, the social contagion part. But of course, you know, this is, you know, this is a, a long running interest of mine, um, but it's just a very particular instance of the type of question that we can ask uh, in computational social science. And you have many speakers coming and they'll talk about many other types of questions. Um, and a lot of them are being powered by uh, similar uh, uh, events that have been happening in the rest of the world, right? That the, the sort of, Matt's right, you know, back in mid 2000s, I, I really was starting to think, oh, you know, social science is becoming a computational field, just like biology became a computational field back in the, uh, in the early 1990s. Uh, and in both cases, it was, you know, these, these changes are in some sense inevitable because they've been driven by much bigger forces that are happening in the world, uh, you know, namely the, the sort of the increasing digitization of almost everything, you know, social life, the economy, communications, like everything is being digitized. Uh, and in the course of being digitized, a lot of ordinary social and economic interactions that used to happen in an analog environment are now generating digital data. So every time we communicate with each other, every time we, we buy something, every time we uh, you know, label uh, uh, something online, we're, we're generating a signal that, uh, that could potentially help social scientists with the kinds of questions that we're, that we're asking. And so this is true for contagion, it's true for lots of other things as well. Um, uh, and so, you know, this is all very exciting, but of course there's lots of challenges and we'll talk about these challenges as well over the next couple of weeks. Um, 
you know, first challenge that, that Matt has written about very eloquently uh, in his textbook uh, is that, you know, on the one hand, it's great that we have all this data that's, you know, falling into our laps uh, from all the things that people are doing. But the downside is that it's been, you know, it, the, the instruments that are generating this data weren't designed to answer the questions of social scientists. And that has some very painful uh, consequences. Uh, one of them is that it's all over the place. It's like sitting in silos in different uh, companies. A lot of it is inaccessible. Uh, and, and most of it is not joinable uh, uh, to uh, other silos. Um, very often, the things that we most would be interested in are not being measured. You know, I mean, why are there so many papers about retweets on Twitter? Because that's what Twitter has. It has retweets. Um, but you know, we actually you know, care about lots of other stuff in social science, but we can't measure that. So we end up studying retweets. Um, uh, and then, of course, you know, there's lots of, of concerns around, uh, around privacy and intellectual property that makes data sharing uh, very difficult. Um, uh, and then a, a final point is that, uh, that a lot of these systems are, uh, because they're uh, designed to engage people rather than to help social scientists, uh, are, are being increasingly optimized by algorithms. So that you know, when, when you click on something on Facebook now, is it because your friends thought that you would like it, or is it because Facebook's news rank algorithm thought that you would like it? And how does that change the kind of inferences we can make um, uh, when we observe this data? So you know, point one is we need better systems for generating uh, observational data. And maybe that means we have to work more with uh, industry to, to join data that's available. Uh, or maybe it means social scientists have to go build their own instruments like the physicists do. Um, uh, a second point that I haven't talked about at all today, but is another very long-running interest of mine, is, is how to do experiments, like lab-style experiments online. Uh, and uh, you know, if you think about the, the history of uh, social science and behavioral science in labs, it's almost all for small n groups of small n groups of people for very short periods of time playing very, very simple games, right? And you know, the real world is large groups of people doing very complicated things over long periods of time. And so we've got this huge kind of generalization gap to jump from uh, labs to the real world. And uh, you know, something that is a, a, a perennial preoccupation of mine is to try to, to, to use the, the online world to push that, that uh, boundary out in design space um, and, and to, to do more uh, realistic uh, experiments. The final thing that I would just finish on in my remaining minute is that uh, you know, there's also, uh, uh, if we want to do uh, social science that kind of engages with the real world, we have to maybe rethink some of our um, uh, 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 preferences as you know over what kind of you know, how we how we choose questions in, in social science and I think we, some of us were talking about this earlier today that that you know um, very often what's good for your scientific career is not necessarily what's good for science uh, and as scientists we are rewarded for publishing uh, uh, papers in journals uh, and very often the preoccupations of those journals is with theory and advancing theory. And this is how we are trained, especially in disciplinary environments. Uh, and this is what we often do to, to advance our careers, is to, to ask, how does my theoretical framework inform some problem? And if we instead turn things around and said, I don't, you know, I, I, I don't care about the theoretical framework, I just care about the problem, it would completely change how we do social science. And so I wrote a paper last year arguing that, um, that we should do that. We should, you know, to some extent, social science should flip things around and say, let's start with a problem and ask, what are the theoretical frameworks that can be brought to bear on this problem? And now we have to start working to reconcile those different theoretical frameworks, whether they arise in economics or in sociology or in psychology or in political science or in computer science. Um, and how can we 
use all of what we know to actually solve a problem in, in the sense that would be recognizable to somebody who's not a professional social scientist. Um, and you know, I sort of throw that out as a, as a challenge for you uh, to think about as you're picking some of the problems that you're going to work on in the next two weeks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Duncan. Um, very fascinating research and then some very unsettling kind of things to think about, which is great because that's how we're going to make progress. Um, so we're going to have some questions. So we'd like to start with a question from the live stream. And then, I mean, from the live stream. And uh, if you're on the live stream, you can add your question into the Slack. And so Janet. So from the Northwestern location, Bashak says, I understand you define diffusion topologically, i.e. network structure. I was wondering whether it is possible to give a mathematical formulation, such as speed of a given contagion-like flow, relative to normal speed of flow. So I assume you're referring to the structural virality yes. project. So you're, you're right, but let me just sort of, so very often when people talk about virality, they're thinking about a parameter and a model. Right, so you have some generative model, whether it's a threshold model or an SIR model or an independent cascade model, and there's some parameter in there that says, you know, conditional on some number of uh, susceptible contacts or some kind of underlying network structure, you know, what's the probability that you know the next person's going to get infected? Right. That is not what we mean by structural virality. Right. Uh, what we mean is there's some process you don't know what it is. There's some underlying structure. You don't know what that is either. Uh, and jointly, they generate some cascade. That's now a thing, right? There's now a, uh, a, a, a structure, a network, that has topological properties. And that's what we're going to measure, right? And you can just, you can just do that, right? You can ask, you know, I'm going to go out there in the world with this measuring stick, and I'm going to measure a bunch of things. Right? And that's really what we're doing mostly in the paper. Now, of course, maybe what you're asking is these things have to be related somehow, right? And in fact, that's true. You can come up with models and network structure, underlying network structures that will generate distributions of structural virality. And we did some of that in the paper as well. And, uh, and so you can use the empirical data about structural virality to validate different types of models. Um, but I just want to be clear that you don't have to do that, right? You can just think structurally. And I think this is, you know, it's a confusing point if you're used to thinking about these generative models. But, um, but that's why I always try to say structural virality rather than virality, because it is a, a different property and can be defined quite independently of the generative process uh, that's involved. Um, this might fall under the retweeting is what we can measure, so that's what we use heading. Um, but when I think about things going viral on the internet, I think a lot about reinterpretation and reuse, multiple links to Gangnam Style, reinterpretations of Gangnam Style, people. And so is that, if you, is that something you've thought about including mm -hmm. in the way that you're measuring virality? And if you were able to or if you did, do you think that would change the 99% of things don't go viral part of this? So. It's a great question. There are a couple of ways in which we could be missing things, right? So one is that, uh, which is a sort of l very limited form of what you're talking about, is that stuff can be can can spread across platforms, right? So I could, you know, I could see something on Twitter, and then I could I could go on Facebook and post it on Facebook, uh, and uh, uh, you know. So that would look like I was breaking. Uh, it would look like there were two separate cascades, but in reality, they're the same cascade. Or maybe I see something on Twitter and I email my friend about it, and then my friend goes and posts it on Facebook. And so now there's this sort of, you know, Twitter to email to Facebook. Uh, and if we were able to sort of thread these things together, uh, 
then suddenly we, we would see like a, a much more viral picture of the world. Now, we tried to do that with a couple of different uh, websites where we instrumented their content with unique URLs. Um, and that was, that was exactly the motivation, was to, to do a cr cross-platform tracking. Um, and the bottom line is it didn't look any different, even though we do see stuff spreading mostly from Twitter to Facebook. Um, unfortunately, the, over the course of you know, the years that it took us to get this system to run and all the engineering challenges we had to overcome uh, working with third parties to, to implement it, uh, Twitter and Facebook changed in such a way that you know, all of the native sharing and retweeting that happens inside them basically breaks the URL uh, tracking mechanism. And so, um, so we don't actually know for sure because it, it tends to flatten the cascades. So the data that we have looks super flat, super broadcasty, even more broadcasty than what I showed you. But it's almost certainly an underestimate of the virality of things. So the second point you brought up, which is, I think, more conceptually interesting, um, is that you know, contagion kind of happens in the brain, in, you know, in human minds, in a more kind of creative way, right? That, so, you know, we were, so some of us were talking earlier about the um, uh, Occupy Wall Street. And, you know, one way in which Occupy Wall Street had an impact is that it spawned a whole bunch of other hashtag Occupy movements, right? So that was a form of social contagion. But you wouldn't see that if you were just tracking Occupy Wall Street references, right? But as a human, you look at that and you, you know where it came from, right? And it's true with Gangnam Style, you saw, you know, there were, um, my favorite version of this was people were putting Christmas lights or holiday lights on their houses and having the lights, the light displays dance to Gangnam Style. <laughs> and people, and then that became a competitive thing. And so people were getting crazier and crazier, like, you know, massive light displays. And then those videos were going viral, right? Or going viral. Um, and um, they were popular, I should say. <laughs> and, uh, and so that's really tricky, uh, you know, and we've had, um, we don't have any good answers to that. We did talk about that a little bit, and uh, uh, you know, I think in um, in that we have some ideas about how to do that in a in a news context. If we're looking at at, at news articles, um, but uh, but I think I haven't seen anybody uh, uh, take that on in a in a concrete way yet. But I think that will be a uh, a fascinating um, exercise. I'm going to bet that the answer is roughly the same, um, but I still think it's worth doing. So, well, with another question from Northwestern, uh, from Joshua. So he asks, I understand that very few events are truly viral, but is any substantial amount of what I see truly viral? Asked because things which are popular are overrepresented in my feed. Uh huh. Uh, let's see. So that's a different sample again. Um, so it's so the two things that I mentioned were small fraction of events are viral, and a small fraction of total adoptions occur in viral events. Um, and this is a different sampling, again, where you pick a node in the network and ask, of all the things that come across my feed, what percentage are viral? Um, I don't know the answer to that. And I'm not sure if it's obvious from the other two. Um, what we do know is that 
at least on Twitter, that a large proportion of, uh, of tweets that appear on a randomly selected feed come from a small fraction of seeds, right? So that there's a, basically because, you know, there's a small number of people with a large number of followers, and so most of what a random user gets comes from one of those, uh, one of that relatively small number, right? So this was several years ago, but there was about 20,000 nodes, 20,000 users on Twitter that accounted for 50% of what a random person would see on their feed, right? But that's not because they're going viral, right? That's just because they have lots of followers, right? So that's totally consistent with the nothing goes viral. Um, you know, you're just one step away from all of these users. Um, so I would have to think more about, uh, about whether viral content is overrepresented. That's not clear to me. Anyway, it's an interesting question. I would just say that, that even if it, 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 there's a difference between, it could very well be that the answer is no, and it still seems like it's yes, because those things generate more discussion, right? So just like you, you know, you notice all the times when you miss the subway by five seconds, but you don't remember the times when you just get there, right? Uh, so there are certain things that we, that we notice more. Um, but I, I, I'm not sure. It's a good question. Yeah. Uh, so my question is how this predictability limit uh, might also pose limits on replicability for experiments and with diffusion, especially if you get more complex environments where you have you know, highly path-dependent environments. And then the thought is, in your model where you formulated the ideal set of conditions and you introduced noise and you saw the R squared decrease, uh, is that noise in the diffusion process per se, or could that be viewed as stemming from the complexity of the environment where there are various other things happening that aren't in the diffusion uh, process per se, and then if you create an environment where those are controlled for, you mm. can actually get greater uh, replicability. So to answer the second question, so when you say replicability, do you mean in the sort of replication crisis notion of replicability? Like how do I replicate so-and-so's results? Or like if I run the same process on a network 100 times, will I get the same answer? Uh, well, the, primarily the, the second, but it oh. relates to the, the first as well. But. So the, I, I guess the question is, you know, at what, uh, at what level of abstraction are you, are you asking for replicability, right? So, you know, so Matt's PhD dissertation was about, um, you know, the unpredictability of success in cultural markets, right? Um, but, you know, that result that, you know, that it's in some sense predictable that things are unpredictable, right? So we can replicate the unpredictability result, but the whole point of the unpredictability result is that you can't replicate like one run of history. So if we went back to 1998 and, you know, J.K. Rowling was, you know, sitting in a coffee shop writing the first, uh, uh, you know, instantiation of Harry Potter and then reran history from that moment on, the claim would be something else would have happened, right? And we, you know, we wouldn't have Harry Potter and we'd have some other book that we were all talking about. Um, so in that sense, history is not replicable, but the process, the result about unpredictability is, right? So another way to think about that is um, you can make predictions about distributional properties but not about positional properties, right? So you could say, I know what the distribution looks like, but I don't know where this element is going to fall in the distribution, right? And we actually found that in the music lab experiment where we, we actually did replicate it with a different population, and we found that they preferred different songs, right, on average, right? So they, had a, they were an older population, they had different musical tastes, and so the exact average ranking of 
the songs differed from population one to population two, but the, uh, but the treatment effect of introducing social influence, that was consistent across the populations, okay? So, uh, so I think that uh, you know, when you talk about replicability, you have to be very precise about what you mean. And I think the, you know, we, we are finding that this sort of you know, limits to prediction result is consistent. And, and Matt has another recent example that I'm sure he will tell you about. On Friday, uh, you'll get to experience it yourself. There we go. <laughs> so uh, where you know, even more dramatically lower R squareds were accomplished in spite of an enormous amount of effort from a lot of people. Um, and uh, you could say, oh, well, you know, we could have predicted that. In fact, some of us did predict that. Well, anyway. Well, it's more complicated. <laughs> okay. Oh, whoa, I see. Okay. Um, yeah. All right. So, um, so uh, okay. So, uh, so that, I think, answers the first question. And then the second question was about um, uh, things spreading on the network and, uh, and, and whether there are other factors that are not sort of uh, interior to the model that might influence uh, uh, outcomes, and could you sort of control those away? And the answer is, in the simulation, we absolutely, that's exactly what we did do, right? That there was nothing outside of the model. And so even, even then, you get this result, that, you're, you know, that the, the maximum R squared you can expect is, is pretty low once you get some heterogeneity and some, and some error in your measurement. I, I think that if I'm understanding where your question is coming from, that you're right, that in the real world, there's always other stuff, right? And, and that's just gonna make things more random and more complicated, right? So in some sense, you know, Music Lab and, and, and this study were, were all um, really, um, you know, lower bounds on unpredictability, that you know, everything is like strictly more unpredictable and more complicated uh, in, in the real world where there's all this other stuff going on uh, than in these, in these very sort of toy environments. So I think that just sort of strengthens the, the case. Um, I, it's the sort of thing that I think would be completely obvious, that this is obviously true, except for the fact that everybody hates the answer. And so they just really, really want it to not be true, right? <laughs> um, it, it sort of, um, you know, also the, uh, you know, questions about like, well, surely stuff is more viral than that, right? I and mean, imagine a world in which lots of things went viral all the time, right? You know, your brain would explode, right? That everybody would go crazy, and then we would all up our thresholds, and stuff would stop spreading again, right? So there's sort of a almost an efficient market hypothesis here, where you know, if you if you like discovered the secret to making things go viral, and then you went around making everything go viral. Right, the world would change to stop you, right? So, so viral things, in some sense, have to be rare, because anything else would be impossible, right? So, a lot of this stuff, you know, actually is, I think, pretty obvious. Um, it's just obvious. well, <laughs> except for the obvious things, um, which are not obvious because people don't like them. Um, more questions, one more from the live stream, and then one more here. The live stream. Uh, actually, two kind of questions that did go together from Northwestern. So first, Josh asks, how do the limits of predictability manifest themselves in the social sciences as opposed to other sciences, like different limits of predictability? Uh, but also, uh, Eni asks, platform algorithms are playing an increasingly significant role in affecting what people see on digital platforms. So how do we start to account for that in our research on diffusion? And would we come to a point in the future where the success equation would mostly be determined by platform algorithms? Right. So first question about social versus non-social sciences. Um, well, I think... Uh, I think it, it's sort of, um, it's more about um, the complexity of a system, right? So this is in the, you know, complex, you know, adaptive systems, uh, you know, meaning of, of complexity. Uh, so, you know, in physics, for example, 
uh, a lot of progress has been made uh, with deterministic models that really um, operate with relatively few um, interacting components, right? So we can, we can, you know, model the solar system like basically as a two-body problem, right? And then there's like a little perturbation because of Jupiter. Um, uh, you know, if there were two Jupiters, things would get really bad for a celestial mechanics. So, um, so you can sort of make these, these simplifying approximations in, in certain physical systems that just do really, really well, right? And then you sort of, you know, have very, very complicated models that, that uh, you know, that, you know, JPL uses to decide, you know, uh, you know, how to launch satellites uh, and, you know, and, and probes to Mars that, that can uh, do an incredibly good job of, you know, putting a, you know, an orbiter around a planet that's a few billion miles away with an error that, you know, is, you know, like 100 miles, right? Or, or maybe you know, less than that, right? So that's, like, amazing precision, right? We can never come anywhere close to that in, in any kind of social sciences. Um, so, and, and so I think it's, it's not so much social versus physical or engineering, it's more about complexity. And it just so happens that just everything in the social world is, is really complex because almost everything involves lots of people uh, interacting with each other in, 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 in many different ways uh, over long periods of time. And people themselves are kind of stochastic, right? Like, you know, we don't give consistent answers to the same question over time. We often don't know what we're going to do, you know, tomorrow. Um, uh, we have sort of imperfect understanding of our own preferences. So you have a bunch of sort of noisy, inconsistent, you know, people, you know, bouncing around in a, in a you know, at scale. Like, it's not surprising that it's complicated, right? So I, I think... Um, and that, I think, is true for a lot of science, really. It's just that uh, science has done a very good job of skirting around that. You know, like I, uh, uh, my colleague from Santa Fe Institute, Don Farmer, used to say that, you know, physicists have done really well at, like, solving the simple problems, right? That they sort of bite off the bits that, um, that are sort of single scale and deterministic uh, and it just so happens that there's enough of those problems in, in physics that we can, we can do really well. But as soon as, as soon as you get into sort of multi-scale, you know, stochastic, you know, complex systems, it's bad in physics as well, right? So, um, you know, like physicists aren't very good at, you know, predicting the particular pattern that your, you know, cream will make when you stir it into your coffee, right? Like, that, if you chose to solve that problem, it would be a really hard problem to solve. We have a lot of trouble simulating the climate, right? Uh, so, uh, or even predicting the weather more than a couple of days in advance. So, so complex systems are kind of bad everywhere they come up in science. Um, they're just, there's just not any parts of social science that aren't complex systems, so that's why it's so difficult. Um, and the second question was about, you know, what happens as platforms become more algorithmically confounded. And I mean, I, I think from my perspective, what happens is they become less useful as instruments for doing social science, right? If, if, you, if, you, if you just don't know what you can infer because there's this, there's this black box machine that even the people who built it don't understand, right? Who knows, right? It, you know, it, we just don't know what, it, we, it, it's not that we, you know, we just don't know what to infer, right? So I think that that's like a really bad feature for, uh, you know, for a, 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 an instrument, um, for, for, for a scientific instrument. And unlike some of the other criticisms that, that people have had over the years about, about using online platforms to do social science, like, you know, they're not representative or whatever, um, uh, that one's getting worse, right? So uh, that, that is a real, a real concern, and, and, and maybe one day we just have to walk away and not use those systems anymore. Yeah, I was, 
<clears throat> I was wondering, this might be a, a version of that question, but I was wondering with uh, the virality on Twitter, if you had thought about, um, I guess, just the dynamic nature of the Twitter network and whether or not people are following or unfollowing people mm -hmm. sort of in an effort to, uh, you know, be able to share the most viral tweet earlier or go viral or see viral content. And I guess more broadly, whether or not um, there are then like external validity concerns just because Twitter is sort of a, a context in which people are sharing and, and consuming explicitly to share as opposed to sort of interacting on some hmm. like lattice that exists for other reasons like, you know, friendships or commerce or things like that. So Twitter is definitely an evolving system and, you know, like we certainly have worried about that. You know, the most uh, disruptive thing that they did was, you know, introduce the native retweet. So before that, which was several years ago now, you know, if you wanted to retweet a piece of content, you had to, you know, cut and paste the text and put it in a, your own Twitter box and, and type RT, right? Um, and now you just, you know, click the retweet button. So, you know, the day they introduced that, the sort of number of retweets just went through a step function. It was like somebody just changed the universal law of gravitation or something, you know, just like, so, so stuff like that really makes comparisons difficult. Like any study that was done before that is hard to compare with any study that was done afterwards, right? And so stuff like that is happening all the time when they introduce like a new, uh, you know, design changes. Uh, and, and, you know, Twitter is now starting to do some ranking, I think, which, you know, screws with, the, uh, again, the same way that, that the Facebook news feed um, uh, confounds estimates of, of popularity. Any kind of ranking will, will, will do that too. So, um, so you know, we, we worry about that. We're not really set up to do, you know, I mean, maybe one thing you could imagine doing is sort of, you know, longitudinal studies where you're kind of tracking the same thing, you know, have some index of virality or something and you track it over time and you can see how it responds to various things that are happening in the outside world. Um, you know, we haven't done that. Um, uh, but we've also tried to, um, uh, going back to this, this question of, of replication, to sort of keep our, and it's one reason why we sort of stay away from specifics, right? That we're, we're trying to sort of, you know, look at this sort of level of abstraction that we hope will, will be robust to these sorts of changes, right? So the, the you know, the level of, of, of retweet will, will, will change as you make retweeting easier. But the predictability uh, does not really change, right? Um, and you know, you could make us. We have a similar kind of philosophy with respect to Twitter versus not Twitter, where you're absolutely right. Twitter is a very special thing, and it's you know didn't exist 15 years ago. You know, it's not clear that anything outside in the analog world has the same properties. Um, uh, but I think, you know, that the, in terms of these, these very kind of high level claims that we're making about limits to prediction, that those claims should, should carry over. If, if anything, I think that this sort of dying off, um, property that is essential to, to, you know, the dynamics that we're observing. Is, is even more likely to be true in an analog world where it's just more expensive to, to retweet things. So, um, but you know, we haven't actually checked, right? So that is, a, I mean, I'm not even sure how you would check because it's very hard to like do apples to apples comparisons, you know, in a world where you have digital instrumentation and a world where you don't. Um, but you know, that I think would be a really interesting attempt you know, if somebody could, if you had some creative ideas about how to do that, that would be an interesting contribution. Okay. Um, thank you again, Duncan, for a wonderful talk and a wonderful way to begin the Summer Institute. Thank you. Thanks for your questions. Okay. So for everyone on the live stream, thank you for tuning in, and we'll see you.
tomorrow at 9.15 a.m. Eastern Time.